Uh, Legal Momentum and Zero are very excited to be joined on this webinar by Deputy Chief Pete Keyline of the Appleton Police Department and Lieutenant Chris Cole of the Storm Lake Police Department. Pete and Chris have lots of good tips and advice, so I hope people are already thinking of questions that they'd like to post to both of them. In a few minutes, seconds, we're going to do introductions and all that, but before we do that, I wanted to get to this. We did just want to mention that Legal Momentum and Vera are hosting this webinar as part of the U.S. Department of Justice Bureau of Justice Assistance grant. And of course, the opinions or statements made by the presenters are not those of BJA. Similarly, the presenters' opinions are not necessarily those of the agencies that they work with or are part of. So let's get into the overview. Uh, really quickly, uh, as you all know, our webinar is running for one hour. Uh, however, within that one hour, we're aiming to dedicate about 20 minutes uh, for a question and answer period. I know a lot of you must have a lot of questions for Pete and Chris, uh, so we're going to give you all that opportunity. And let me just run through what we're going to be doing today. First, I'm going to do an overview of what we are covering, and I'm doing that right now, so we're on track. And then in a couple of minutes, I'll give some, uh, we'll go over some quick housekeeping. After that, we're going to do a faculty introduction so that you learn a little bit more about the people who are uh, presenting today. And then we're going to jump into the, the, the bulk of the webinar. First, we're going to discuss what is the U visa. And then we're going to discuss the process for obtaining a U visa. Now, one thing that I do want to mention is that we know that all of you have a range of knowledge with regard to the U visa. And as we were designing this webinar, we tried to tailor it so that we would provide a lot of information without it being overwhelming. Of course, we may have missed the mark, so if the information we are presenting is too basic or too complex, please let me know via the chat feature, and we'll try to adjust because we'll be able to see uh, what, what the comments are. And of course, we welcome uh, clarifying questions or any other questions during the question and answer period. Okay, back to the overview. After discussing the U visa, we're going to jump into law enforcement's use of the U visa. And at this point, we're going to cover a couple of important considerations that law enforcement might have when it comes to the U visa, such as certification and using the U visa as a community policing tool. Then, as I mentioned, we'll have a question and answer period. And then we'll give you our contact info. And something that's really important is that we will have an evaluation um, we, we will have an evaluation at the very end uh, that will pop up. So hopefully um, it will be great for, uh, for everybody to fill it out and give us your comments on what we can improve and what, you know, uh, we did well. Okay. So with that, that's a quick overview. And again, uh, housekeeping is just everybody's on mute. All the, part all the participants are on mute. Um, but you can contact me via the chat function, okay? So with that, let's do a quick round of introductions, and then we'll jump into the webinar. So I'll just go first. Uh, my name is Rodolfo Estrada, and I'm a senior program associate at the Vera Institute of Justice. Along with my work on this project, training law enforcement on the use of the U visa, I also work on Vera's Engaging Police and Immigrant Communities project that is funded by the Department of Justice COPS office. Um, and our goal for that one COPS office project is to assess promising practices in building strong police immigrant relations. So let's just go in order of who's uh, speaking when. So Edna, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Edna Yang. I'm the general counsel with American Gateways, which is a nonprofit organization that runs out of Austin, Texas. And we provide immigrant legal, immigration legal services to indigent immigrants throughout central Texas. We're also a member of a number of coalitions that include law enforcement agencies, um, and we've discussed at length how to uh, make a uniform U visa process here in Central Texas. I'm also a consultant with Legal Momentum. Okay, great. Pete? Uh, good afternoon. My name is Pete Heline. I'm a Deputy Chief of Operations with the Appleton, Wisconsin Police Department. Appleton's a community of about 75,000 people. Uh, we have 108 sworn officers here. Uh, my primary focus over the years has been uh, domestic violence. I really have a passion for training law enforcement officers and remain committed to finding a better way to meet the needs of crime victims. I really believe that predictable is preventable and certainly have had the pleasure of not only participating in the training today, but also in working with Legal Momentum and the Bureau Institute of Justice and in providing other law enforcement uh, training 
Uh, specifically, we had a very successful uh, session here in Appleton that we'll talk about a little bit later, but certainly look forward to uh, sharing information with all of you. Uh, Chris? My name is Chris Cole. I'm a lieutenant with the Storm Lake, Iowa Police Department. Uh, I've been employed here for about 17 years. Uh, Storm Lake is a, a city of about 12,000 people. We're located in northwest Iowa. We're known in the state of Iowa as being one of the most eth ethnically diverse communities in the state, with our uh, public school district being about 73.7% non-Caucasian. We have a large percentage of uh, populations of Hispanics, Southeast Asians, including Hmong, Laotian, and Vietnamese. We also have a pretty good number of Sudanese and Somalians. I just wanted to say that I'm honored to be here today and assist in the training and share our, the experiences that we've had in Storm Lake uh, with dealing with U-Visa cases. Okay, great. So with that, let's just jump into the first part. Uh, what is the U-Visa? Great. So we're going to begin today by defining what the U-Visa is. And the U-Visa, for those of you who don't have any experience with it, is a temporary four-year visa for non-citizen victims of crime who have suffered substantial mental and physical abuse resulting from the crime of which they are a victim. These individuals also have to be willing to cooperate with law enforcement in the detection, investigation, or prosecution of that criminal activity. So what Congress did in 1994 and in 2000 was create two different types of remedies for victims of family violence and victims of certain violent crimes. In 1994, they created the VALA self-petitioning process, um, and in 2000, they created the U-Visa, uh, which is what our conference today is going to focus on. So both of these types of laws allow victims to report crimes without fear of deportation. And they also improve community policing and community relationships. The idea that Congress had was to allow victims who would be afraid to report things that had happened to them because of their immigration status to feel comfortable in coming forward, and in doing so, really increase the safety of all communities. It also increases the law enforcement capacity to investigate and prosecute crimes and has an overall effect of providing communities that are much more safer because we'll have individuals who feel comfortable calling the police when, things, uh, when crimes happen to them. The U visa process um, is, starts with a law enforcement certification as well as the application. And the law enforcement certification, which is what most of you um, will be focusing on and what the vast majority of this webinar is, is really just certifying that an individual is a victim of a certain crime and it has to be a certain violent crime. And we'll go through that list in one second. Um, and also certifying that that person has been helpful in the detection, investigation, or prosecution of that crime. There's a separate application process in which the certification fits in, and you have to meet all of those other requirements under the application process in order to be granted a U visa. Once there's an approval, the individual will have the U visa status for four years. It's important to know that there is a 10,000 uh, limit cap on the U visas. So there's only 10,000 that are issued by immigration every year. In the end, some of those individuals who have U visas will also later qualify for their legal permanent residency. The other thing that I wanted to mention about the certification is that it's not all only law enforcement that can actually certify the U visa. So there are some non-criminal law enforcement type agencies that can also certify that may investigate crimes that have happened to immigrant victims. Uh, for example, the EEOC can be a certifier and so can Child Protective Services or Adult Protective Services if there are issues of abuse and neglect that are going on. The basic requirements for a U visa is that the individual who is applying, the victim, has to be a victim of a qualifying criminal activity. And the next couple of slides will discuss the actual criminal activity that's covered under the U visa. They also have to show that they have been, are currently being, or are likely to be helpful in the investigation, detection, investigation, or prosecution of a crime. And they have to demonstrate that they've suffered substantial physical or mental abuse as a result of the victimization. They have to possess information about the crime and demonstrate that the crime occurred in the U.S. or violated U.S. law. One of the issues that comes up with the U visa certification is the question of liability. Um, and many law enforcement officers have asked about it when they're certifying. And they feel that perhaps if they sign a certification, they then become responsible for this immigrant victim. And what if this immigrant victim then commits a crime against someone else? 
But the important thing to remember about the U visa is that the certification is only one part of the actual U visa application and process. You have to meet other uh, requirements under the U visa law in order to be granted a U visa. And the ultimate agency that decides to grant a U visa is the Department of Homeland Security or Immigration. The only thing that the certification is doing is certifying that this person is a victim of a qualifying criminal activity and that they have been helpful, they're currently being helpful, or they're likely to be helpful in the detection of the crime that's occurred. So this is an example of the criminal activities that are covered under the U visa. And one of the things that uh, I'd like you all to note is they're all violent crimes against individuals, against persons. So there's no crimes against property that are covered under the U visa. The other thing is these are generic crimes that are listed under the federal law for the U visa, but in certain states there may not actually be, for example, felonious assault. There may be uh, some other type of crime that would be uh, similar to felonious assault, and that can also be certified, and that's why they have any similar activity listed under the criminal activities covered. They also have attempts of all of these crimes that can be covered as well. So the U visa certification allows law enforcement to, um, to really use the state laws, the state penal laws, to cover the criminal activity that the victim is reporting. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Edna. And, and what we're going to do, uh, I, I, a couple of questions came in already. We're going to save them for the uh, end of the webinar. Um, but thank you all for starting to post the questions. And before we turn it over to the law enforcement presenters to give an overview of, of, of law enforcement's use of the U visa, it's important to stop here and just quickly touch on some of the reasons why immigrants fail to report crimes. Um, again, as, you know, as we've been discussing, the U visa was created with the intent of furthering the ability of police to detect crimes and prevent crimes. But why, why do you actually need uh, a, a visa? Uh, why do you actually need this? Um, I mean, you know, the, the, the whole idea is that why don't immigrants just naturally want to come forward and report when they're a victim of a crime? Now, just scanning the participant list, I know that um, you all probably have an answer for me, and that answer is that because they might fear the police, they might feel uncomfortable approaching the police. And in reality, I think we see this a lot, where when an immigrant, an undocumented immigrant is a victim of a crime, they do feel uncomfortable. You know, the classic example that we keep on hearing about is, say, domestic violence, where the, the woman is dependent on the abuser for legal status. And not only is she dependent on the abuser for legal status, but maybe the kids are U.S. citizens, and since she's not, she's afraid of getting deported and then being separated from kids. You know, added on to that, there might be language barriers, where, for example, you know, the, the victim might speak Spanish or Mandarin or Creole, and they might not feel comfortable uh, calling with the police, first of all, because they can't speak with the police, but second of all, because of the dynamics of what would happen if the police showed up. You know, when we've been doing our trainings, we've heard that uh, there have been situations where, you know, uh, you know, the worst, most horrible scenario, you have uh, the, the abuser who's acting as an interpreter for the, the victim. There's a lot of issues here, you know, and I think it's important before we begin this discussion with law enforcement to keep in mind that there are a lot of reasons why immigrant victims uh, fail to report crimes. And we've listed in here, you know, we're not going to go too in depth because I know you all know these. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's a good point to discuss uh, and to think about before we turn it over to law enforcement. So, uh, Pete, why don't you start us off with um, why the U visa is important for law enforcement? Well, I think, uh, quite honestly, uh, the U visa process provides some level of, of stability. When we look at uh, taking a look at, at what law enforcement's uh, capabilities are uh, is incredible. The dynamics of domestic violence in and of themselves, the fear that exists, uh, the, the harm to children and, and the threatening um, threats that are made are, are in and of themselves can be very uh, overwhelming to a person. And then you add on the immigration and deportation becomes even more significant. So from my standpoint, it's so important to get law enforcement officers to understand not only the dynamics of the crime uh, that's being investigated or reported, 
but also the dynamics in, in to try to reach some level of understanding of what that undocumented immigrant who is also a crime victim is going through and some of the techniques and tactics that the perpetrators are using against uh, the victims also uh, lend themselves to um, specialized questioning and follow-up that perhaps wouldn't do in a normal domestic. I'm trying to uh, get this to advance to slide, yeah, here we go, uh, slide number 12, and, and really uh, some basic tenets of law enforcement's use of the UVs include the uh, really promoting the agency's public safety efforts, and, and really you do that by engaging the community. Uh, not only as a police chief or supervisor, but also the day-to-day, -day, the officers out on the street with the boot time, having that face-to-face -face time and really speaking loudly about the importance of investigating uh, these types of crimes and to, to recognizing the dynamics that exist. It's, it's all too often uh, so many agencies forget to talk about publicly uh, what their mission is, fighting crime, solving problems, uh, recognizing the difference between uh, actual crimes and reported crimes. When, so we, when educating law enforcement officers and helping them understand not only the dynamics of the, the additional threats that go with uh, the immigration issues, but also trying to get them in advance of crime to develop that trust with the community so that they, they understand, the officer, the investigating officer understands that undocumented immigrants are feeling this sort of harm or the, threat of ICE that exists and trying to get officers to connect with that level of understanding in advance and to build uh, some of that trust. In terms of extending benefits to the community, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, really have to pay attention to is that crime should be considered a, a community issue that requires a community response. Uh, there's a great benefits to the community. Uh, that include the reduction of crime rates and improved quality of life when everybody accepts and acknowledges and works together to address the uh, particular uh, victimization that's occurring in that community. And, and certainly it's important for police departments as well as communities to recognize the value of diversity and focus on threatening behavior and violent crime. That's, that's the big catch for me is that all too often, uh, we're getting caught up in, in this isn't an immigration issue. This is an issue about connecting uh, with people who are very vulnerable and have been victimized in a very terrible way uh, to come forward so that we can reduce crime, so that we can uh, meet their needs. Certainly, the U visa as a, a crime fighting tool uh, is, is huge. Uh, in Wisconsin, there we go. Uh, the, the U visa as a crime fighting tool um, is essential in terms of building trust between the immigrant community and law enforcement. And one of the ways that we do that is, is in my own mind, trust equals cooperation. And cooperation equals increased reporting of crimes. And if we have increased reporting of crimes, we're going to have improved quality of life. So the building trust really pays dividends through that relationship piece over an extended period of time. When we look at demonstrating law enforcement's commitment to victim safety for everybody, uh, quite honestly, actions speak louder than words. Uh, all too often, uh, we don't back up our words with our actions, and that's critical uh, in this area when it comes to UVs and educating people and using that, making it operational, if you will, uh, within your respective community. Uh, we need to get law enforcement officers to respect diversity and encourage officers and agencies to connect with the minority communities, and not at the point where uh, there's a overwhelming problem uh, or a crisis at hand. It's the, the sharing a meal together, getting together in advance and talking through uh, issues and concerns that exist, that that really builds that trust, and that's when we really begin to realize the benefits of it as a crime-fighting tool. Uh, the increased crime reporting when immigrants uh, victims by reducing the fear of deportation absolutely makes sense. Uh, we can't underestimate the importance of this reality. Reduce crime rates, reduce cost to the police department, and the reduced cost to the community. So uh, when people say, what's in it for me, the reality of it is uh, significant in, in respect to reduction in crime and in pre in 
improved quality of life within the community. Um, we've had uh, the opportunity, the Wisconsin Coalition Against Domestic Violence, the Immigrant Project uh, in Wisconsin, really uh, had a, um, a great project in the sense that they uh, were able to obtain a grant that provided undocumented immigrants who were victims of crimes with assistance with the U visa process. Uh, this particular program covered 11 counties in the state of Wisconsin and provided assistance by identifying and training law enforcement officers and prosecutors on the certification process. So it really uh, was beneficial in terms of getting the word out and getting people in key positions that could certify uh, the U visas and provide uh, some level of assistance and support. And that occurred in 11 counties throughout the state of Wisconsin. Uh, and in addition to the certification process, uh, they also collaborated with domestic violence and sexual assault project partners so that together uh, we could address uh, throughout the state this particular need. So in consideration of the, the different uh, specialties with the various crimes, uh, coalitions and advocates were able to come together and work with law enforcement and uh, certainly supported uh, many undocumented immigrants uh, with assistance. And next. Chris? The certification as far as what, what considerations uh, the law enforcement officers need to take when certifying uh, a U visa are, are really very simple. Um, oftentimes we get questions as far as what, what exactly is the certification. It sounds like something's very complex. Uh, certifying uh, or by certifying a U visa is not an automatic, uh, by signing it, you're not automatically giving them a U visa. Uh, the certification process essentially is just a sworn statement from uh, an officer stating that uh, the victim on the application is indeed a victim of a qualifying offense and that that person has been uh, or has been likely to uh, be helpful in the past, future, or present uh, in the actual investigation. As far as who can actually certify uh, a U visa, it has to either be a supervisor or someone designated by the chief or sheriff, whoever the department head is uh, in that particular agency. Um, but like I said, by signing it, it isn't an automatic uh, U visa. What happens is there has to be an extensive background done uh, by Homeland Security, and uh, they do backgrounds in, into all the, uh, if there's arrests on that person or, or any other uh, issues, they do a background. In, and that's one of the big questions that, that I see uh, people ask me is, you know, when I'm signing a U visa, uh, what if this person's got a criminal record or, you know, I'm giving them, you know, permission to stay in the country. Well, you're actually, you're just certifying that it's a qualifying crime and that they have been cooperative. Uh, as far as have they been cooperative and helpfulness, the regulations uh, in the statute, there's no actual amount of helpfulness required or no degree of helpfulness required by statute. And these crimes that uh, are listed, as we know as law enforcement, all crimes are unique. There's no, uh, no crime is exactly the same. And that's what we have to look at when we're doing certifications as far as is this person being helpful. We have to take into consideration uh, each case and, and look at the victim and look at the circumstances behind it, um, especially when we're dealing with uh, folks that there's language barriers. It's easy for officers to, uh, if they don't have a good understanding of what that victim is trying to say or trying to get across to them, if you don't have a good translator there, it's easy for uh, initial investigating officers to think that maybe that person wasn't being helpful or wasn't being cooperative. Uh, but we need to take into effect or into account uh, language barriers and so forth. And, you know, in domestic abuse cases, uh, you need to look at that. Uh, as we know, oftentimes people uh, have a difficult time at first telling, you know, the whole story. But we need to take that into account when we're doing a certification. As far as... Uh, the investigation need not be uh, complete. What that would be is uh, 
if the case is ongoing, uh, let's say that there's a, a street robbery or a, a, some sort of an assault where a person was victimized and maybe the uh, perpetrator hasn't been brought back to justice yet, that person is at large or they don't, the officers, the investigators don't know who that offender is, uh, that victim is still eligible for a U visa uh, even if the arrest hasn't been made or the, the investigation is not complete. Um, as long as that person is still being cooperative uh, towards the investigation or is likely to be cooperative. Uh, has been helpful, is being helpful, or is likely to be helpful, is uh, uh, listed in the statute for the detection, the investigation, and or prosecution of the case. Uh, two main things that we look at uh, as far as helpfulness, you know, the main thing, like I said earlier, we want to make sure that the applicant uh, was a victim of a qualifying offense. And then you just basically have to look at the case and uh, look at the facts and see if you feel that that person uh, was helpful in the investigation. Uh, another question that I sometimes see or have people ask is what if that victim uh, cooperated at first but is no longer cooperating? Once a certifying officer signs off on a U visa, there, there's no ongoing responsibility uh, once it's signed, uh, but if that person feels that later that the victim is being unreasonably uh, uncooperative or is no longer being helpful, uh, the officer can make contact um, with the uh, VAWA unit in Vermont and advise them of the situation. Uh, but that would be in, an, in a case where it would be an unreasonable uh, amount, you know, something that uh, they're, you know, absolutely not being cooperative in that particular investigation. Uh, other examples, uh, reporting a crime with no further investigation. That might be, you know, sometimes uh, depending on the crime, there may be a plea agreement. Uh, the person is a victim. They, uh, they've been cooperative, they've been helpful in the investigation, but for whatever reason, the prosecutor chooses not to proceed. That person would, uh, you know, would be eligible to apply for a U visa. Uh, or there is also a case that uh, we were told of where there was a, a homicide and uh, an individual was an indirect victim where he was uh, actually witnessed his brother uh, killed, was right there present when it happened. And uh, the person was cooperating with the authorities, uh, gave statements uh, and the suspects were ultimately arrested and charged with murder, and but for whatever reason, the prosecutors never used that person as a witness. Um, but based on the way the U visa is set up, he would be eligible for a U visa, even if he's not needed as a witness. If he was cooperative at the time and uh, was an indirect victim, he, he could be eligible. Criminal history, again, like I said, um, we try not to take that into account uh, when we're looking at the certification. We're just certifying uh, whether or not this was a, a qualified crime and whether or not they're being cooperative. Um, but there is going to be cases, uh, like I said, there's no cookie cutter uh, answer for this. There is going to be cases where people try and abuse things. Uh, we've we've had some locally here where gang members, uh, a violent gang member, got arrested and then. Uh, tried to apply for a U visa at the last minute on his last ditch effort, and that's just going to be a judgment call on that, uh, whoever that certifying person, whether or not they want to sign that certification or not. But that is something that you could have to deal with if you're certifying these. Uh, as far as uh, subjects or the victims being uh, subject to immigration enforcement, uh, most cases uh, that's a possibility. Uh, these folks that are getting the U visas are uh, generally not here on legal status, so that's something that uh, we don't really get involved in that. We just let, once it's certified, uh, UC or USCIS does the background through Homeland Security, and they're the ones who, who go through that, and they have the ability or the discretion to uh, waive that if they choose. Other uh, ways that we see that some agencies look to see if a person has been helpful or if they feel they've been helpful uh, in an investigation, uh, you can look at it whether or not that person was actually the, the person who made the phone call 
the victim was the the individual that called the police, whether or not they actually provided a statement, filed the report, uh, and so forth. Any witness uh, who assisted or came forward and was willing to assist, if they were uh, a victim or an in, uh, a direct victim or indirect victim, um, you know, you could look at that to see if you feel that they've been helpful towards the investigation. All right, uh, this is Pete back on. I will uh, talk a little bit about community policing and the U visa process. Quite honestly, uh, I view the U visa is really uh, an amazing opportunity, if you will. Uh, it certainly has its its uh, benefits uh, clearly to that, that family, and it's, it's clearly an opportunity for uh, law enforcement to, to work closely with advocates and victims of crime to help add some stability to their life. So when I look at it, uh, this is really – the community policing part of it is an obligation that's shared by every man and woman employed by that law enforcement agency. It's not resting simply with the person who certifies uh, the uh, U visas. It, it really uh, needs to be talked about daily as officers are responding uh, to crime. So it, it certainly will strengthen law enforcement's ability to detect, investigate, and prosecute criminal activity by having this relationship, by taking away power from that perpetrator who has terrorized that potential victim with, with threats of deportation and notifying ICE if they don't cooperate or if they call the police. So this process really is founded well within the tenets of community policing, but it really needs to be um, in the day-to-day -day operation of law enforcement as well. Uh, it's not programs, projects have a beginning and an end, uh, but this belief, this philosophy, if you will, the U visa as a tool is really what will help make a difference. And certainly um, bridging the gap between police and minorities. Uh, this is an ongoing endeavor. Uh, it's a critical relationship that exists and requires, uh, again, that face time. Responding officers uh, to the various domestics and crimes must start the process by sharing information about the benefits of the U visa process and by connecting eligible victims with the necessary uh, resources. It makes a huge difference in people's lives, one, you know, one family at a time, one strengthening in a community at a, at a time. It's, it's incredible uh, in terms of bridging that gap. It certainly helps to solve crimes that may not uh, otherwise be reported. We talked already about underreporting of domestic violence and sexual assault and, and victims underreport that because they're afraid, they're fearful for their lives or the lives of their children. The U visa provides a opportunity uh, for them to kind of get, get out from, on, from underneath that threat of deportation, not only themselves but other family members uh, that, that may also be held hostage uh, by that particular threat. When we look at at uh, collaborating, oops, we look at collaborating and educating. There's, there's lots of different ways to do that with flyers and, and promoting it on websites and talking about it, but the reality of it is, is law enforcement needs to be very visible. They need to be very accessible with the community. They need to be talking to small groups and large groups and in church groups, uh, wherever people the minority communities coming together, law enforcement needs to reach out and they need to talk about this. They need to address this fear because if we wait for the opportunity, uh, it may never present itself. But if we create the opportunity, if we create this opportunity of stability, of connecting people with the U visa process, then we will have even greater success within our communities. We also need to understand that the cultural and community pressures within the immigrant groups can silence some of the women and force them away from and isolate them from, from services. So we need to understand the dynamics and the differences within cultures as well. There's not a, a one-size-fits-all or, one size, or one response to meet the needs of every culture. So we ne need to recognize individual nuances and in, in cultural difference that exists. Uh, addressing the language barriers uh, through interpreters and, and trying to increase the number of interpreters will also promote uh, collaboration and education because if we can't talk, if we can't communicate with one another, uh, we aren't going to move very uh, fast in the uh, right direction. So addressing the language barriers 
increasing interpretation services available and working with law enforcement is critical. Last but not least, under collaborating education, is simply acknowledging that the fear exists. Seek to understand, try to understand what it must be like for that victim of a crime to be held hostage, essentially, by the threat of deportation of themselves, their children, or additional family members at that perpetrator. So we need to focus on taking the power away from that perpetrator by working with community groups within our respective uh, communities throughout the country in educating law enforcement, making sure that every man and woman out on patrol uh, acknowledges uh, the U visa process as a potential tool to add some stability into the life of an undocumented immigrant. Rodolfo, back to you. Thanks, Keith. So, uh, so we're right at the you know like the 40 minute uh, mark into the webinar, which is great, right where we wanted to be at. Because now we want to switch over to questions and answers. And I've actually had a, a series of questions coming in through the chat, and I'm going to start posting them. And actually, I'm going to try to unmute everyone so that maybe we can go in order and people can uh, post their questions. And I'll, I'll try that for a couple of minutes to see if it works, because there's like a lot of background noise, then I'll just unmute everyone. Or, I'm sorry, I'll just mute everyone again and then just post them myself. But uh, before we jump into, um, one thing that always comes up, um, so I'm just going to post this question uh, to you, Edna. Uh, one thing that always comes up is the issue of liability. So, for example, um, one thing that I've heard a lot is that people say that they don't want to certify uh, uh, any uh, uh, um, uh, forms because they're concerned of what it means to sign off on it. So, for example, one thing that I've heard is that what happens if, if, if an officer is connected to an individual who winds up being a terrorist or who, you know, um, was a drug dealer back home and then they bring those drugs into the community, are they going to be liable? So uh, that's a great question, uh, Rodolfo. And I think that really Chris and Pete answered a lot of that throughout their presentation uh, as well in terms of discussing what the certification actually is. And the certification is just a, the a law enforcement agency or officer certifying that the person is a victim of one of the listed crimes and that they have been helpful, they're currently being helpful, or they're likely to be helpful in the detection, investigation, or prosecution of those crimes. And then the rest of it is really left to immigration to vet. So they can look at it, the, the application as a whole, and see if this person can qual will qualify for a U visa. And in filing these applications, I will tell you, you do have to disclose a lot of that history. You know, there's fingerprints that are run, uh, background checks that are done, and so the history of individuals does come out, and those things are taken into consideration by immigration when they are actually doing the, uh, when they're actually deciding whether or not to grant a U visa. So the certification is just one part of the application, um, and I think it was. Um, Chris, who also mentioned that in terms of determining what helpfulness is, that's what you should look at. Um, and then if you determine that someone isn't helpful, there is, in extreme cases, um, a possibility of contacting the Vermont Service Center to let them know that as well, too. But taking into consideration someone else's history really isn't a part of the U visa in terms of the certification. Um, all of it does have to be disclosed to immigration. Okay, great. So I'm going to unmute everyone because I know there's uh, questions that, are, that have been posed, and this is the order that I have them. Um, I have Jay, Aviva, Bill, Donna, and Helen, and these are questions that you post through the chat uh, function. So I'm going to unmute everyone, and everybody keep in mind that there, there might be a little bit of background noise, so try to minimize it, uh, but let's start posing the questions. So um, I'm unmuting The conference has been unmuted. So, Jay, do you want to post the first question that you asked? Sure. I was Hi. concerned. With the 10,000 uh, cap, uh, is that a first come, first serve, which I hope not, or are they actually ranking them by the seriousness of the, the, the immigrant's need? Um, so, so, Jay, this is Edna. The 10,000 is a first come, first serve. And it's on the it's for the U1 status. It's for the actual person who is ap uh, applying. Um, and then individuals who uh, don't meet that 10,000 cap for that year are bumped to the next year as well. Yeah. And, and one thing to note is that that cap was finally met this year. 
but it was the first time that that has happened since the UDSA came into existence uh, almost a, uh, over a decade ago. So there's a lot of underuse. Okay. Thank you. No problem. So let's get a, a question from Aviva. So I think um, to some extent the question was answered. I I asked how a victim of manslaughter or murder could be requesting a visa, but. Um, I know that they talked about um, those people who are witnesses to the crime, so I guess they're the ones who fit into that category. So unless there's additional information, I think that was answered. Would have been, you know, I would have. Yeah, and I would also like to mention, this is Edna again, in response to that question, that it can also be direct family members. So um, if you are the child of a parent who's been murdered or the spouse of someone who's been murdered, then you can become an indirect victim um, and apply for a U visa. Yeah. So I'm going to go into Phil. Yes. You had a question. Yeah, I had a. Yeah, I just had a couple. Uh, one quick one is: um, Is there any sort of legal obligation for any agency to uh, complete the certification? And that one, there, there. I can answer that one. There, there isn't. Um, you know, and I'm actually getting a lot of background noise, so I'm going to give it about another minute. I think maybe somebody might be on a cell phone or something. If that doesn't work, then I'll just unmute everybody. Uh, but th there isn't uh, a specific requirement in the statute that you have to uh, sort of buy it. You know, okay, and actually, I'm, I'm just going to unmute everyone because uh, there's a lot of background noise. The conference has been muted. And what I'll do is I'll just start posting the questions as they come in. Uh, but Bill, no, the, there isn't. And, you know, and one of the, the things that we, we stress is um, the proactive use of the U visa by law enforcement. You know, uh, and for all the reasons that Pete and Chris just mentioned, why it's helpful to use it. So there's not necessarily, there's no like specific requirement that's forcing uh, police the department to use it, but it's more within like the capacity of community policing and doing outreach that you want to, that you would want to affirmatively use it. Okay, um, the next question I had was from Donna, and she says, "What can we do for the witnesses of?" Crime. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I just lost. Uh, I have had a case where we were applying for a U visa, but I could only get it for the victim. This was a child molestation case. So, so the question: uh, What can we do for uh, the witnesses of the crime? I have had a case. Uh, uh, I've had a case where we were applying for the U visa, but I can only get it for the victim. Uh, Edna, do you think, what do you think? Yeah, well, I think there may be uh, other types of remedies available for witnesses of crimes that aren't covered by the U visa. So I think it's really important to keep in mind what the U visa is for, and it is for those victims who have been substantially affected by uh, one of the listed crimes and who is being helpful um, in the investigation or prosecution of that crime. Um, and in terms of other um, other individuals such as witnesses, I mean, I think the best thing to really do for, for those individuals, because it is a case-by-case -case basis, is to really work in coalition with other uh, service providers, immigration service providers, NGOs, or private attorneys who may be able to assist that individual with, um, with some immigration advice. I know that oftentimes through our coalition, I'm contacted by the Austin Police Department or by uh, the Sheriff's Office or by other uh, law enforcement agencies and ask to meet with a witness just to go through some options with them. Okay. And I have a couple of questions from Helen. Um, and, and as I'm posting these questions, if I mess up your question, feel free to uh, let me know. Uh, and these, I think, are for Chris and Pete. Uh, one of the questions is, what type of request is law enforcement generally receiving? So is it victims of current crimes or victims of past crimes? And then, uh, so maybe you guys can answer that one. Sure, this, uh, this is, uh, for, for my experience, it's been uh, uh, crime victims of uh, more recent crimes than, than the past, but it, it certainly, I think, because people don't always understand that uh, it does go back and can have a historic nature uh, to it, so I think uh, unfortunately, it's, it's in part due to uh, a lack of understanding that can be for past, and uh, so most of the emphasis on, on current crimes. And I think the, the grant project that we had in, in Wisconsin to reach out to the 11 counties uh, really uh, emphasized uh, 
uh, the importance of connecting with victims, uh, providing the inf having law enforcement provide that information on the front end in the district attorney's office getting involved so that uh, there'd be a little bit more timeliness to the uh, reporting and to the application process. Chris, did you want to add on? Uh, we've we've had them, you know, both ways. I've had some some older cases come through and and some current ones. I mean, it's a little bit of everything. Okay, and I think the the other part of the question or the the other question that she posed is probably more directed for Edna. Um, how are folks interpreting the child victim aspect of U visa request? Specifically, if the child victim is a U.S. citizen, are they signing I nine one eight on behalf of parents of these child victims? Have you um, seen that at all, Um Yes, and I think maybe um, Chris and Pete may be able to talk about their experiences as well, too. But we have represented individuals who have who are children who have been uh, perhaps a victim of sexual assault of a child, and they're U.S. citizens, but their parents are undocumented, and so the parents become indirect victims. And it's kind of what we talked about in terms of the murder manslaughter. Because the parents, especially with young children, we find oftentimes go forward. They're the ones who report to police, um, and they're the ones who continue to assist in the investigation, um, working with their children and with victim witness coordinators and with law enforcement. So we have received certifications um, for those individuals. Okay, and then there's another part. Uh, well, actually, Pete, Chris, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to take that off. Did you guys want to add anything to that? No. Nope. Okay. No. <laughs> That makes it easy. Um, and uh, another question Helen had was, is anyone experiencing defense attorney's concerns about the reporting of a crime as a means to obtain a U visa? And I know this is a big issue. Um, so any thoughts on this? Uh, or I guess maybe in general, the whole idea that the U visa is like a, a – that people might be using it for fraudulent purposes? Uh, this, this is Pete. I'd, I'd just like to speak out on that a, a little bit in, in – all too often, we we hear kind of the uh, the, the myths regarding uh, the U visa process that there's hundreds or thousands of people coming forward uh, making up crimes simply uh, to be eligible, try to become eligible for the U visa process. Certainly not seeing that in our area. It doesn't mean that it could not happen. Uh, but but law enforcement is there really to assess helpfulness, to assess crimes, and in law enforcement officers are assessing the credibility of, of crimes being reported uh, on a daily basis. So uh, really I believe that uh, in the long run they're vetting out those cases where people are providing false information so things aren't going forward. But I know that's one of the myths that, that exists out there and quite honestly I'm not seeing that and I think uh, um, it's unfortunate that uh, some people have that perception. And, and Helen, I want to thank you for posting all these great questions. The last one was, um, how are folks in law enforcement uh, slash prosecutor offices providing the structure to process the request, and how are they supporting the extra burden on resources? So, so that might be a good one. Uh, Pete, have you guys been experiencing like a, a burden on resources? Uh, the, the law enforcement agencies uh, in our county have not. Uh, the way our uh, process is set up is the our local uh, domestic abuse program has been uh, the starting point for the application process, and they work closely uh, with eligible uh, immigrant victims to complete that process. The uh, district attorney's office, uh, uh, there's a designated signer within that office that has been reviewing the applications and signing. Law enforcement uh, in our area, the role has been to uh, get the word out to uh, victims at the time that these crimes are being investigated. So what we've been able to do is kind of share not only the responsibility, but share some of the uh, duties that go with it so that uh, no one agency is uh, overburdened. Okay, great. And, and what I just did right now is I put up the contact slide. Um, through this grant, uh, Vera and Legal Momentum can provide technical assistance to um, law enforcement. So, for example, if you're a, if you're a, a you know a police officer who is interested in learning more about the U visa and want to start it up in your agency, what you can do is you can email us or call us, and you can talk with uh, uh, Chris and P and a couple of other individuals who are working with us on this project about how to do it, how to implement it. 
Um, and part of the reason why I put it up, because we have a question from Donna saying, I am approximately 50 miles from, uh, I believe that's Kansas City. Do you have a point of contact for Missouri? I don't. I don't know if anybody else on the webinar has one, but, but Donna, what I would suggest is that you email IWP at LegalMomentum.org and ask for that. And I'm sure we could find some, some sort of contact for you. Okay, another question that I have was John from John. Is the victim cooperated with the police, but maybe did not with the prosecution, uh, with the district attorney's office? Uh, we don't follow all cases through court. Should they get the certification form completed by the DA's office if the case went to court? I guess one one way would be, uh, Edna, what are your thoughts on that? And then maybe we could ask uh, Chris and Pete. Well, um, I think it's really up to, I think it's, it, it, the question is a, a good one because it points to the, the need for agencies to kind of work together and figure out how they're going to certify the U visa. So, um, I know that in one of the areas that we serve, if a case goes to the district attorney's office, that's who we go to for the certification. If for some reason it doesn't get picked up for prosecution, then we go to uh, the police department. And that's something that was worked out within our coalitions. And I don't know how, Chris and Pete, um, how it's working in your area or if you have something, um, <clears throat> some sort of process like that that you've all set up. Uh, in, uh, in Iowa, for us, you know, we have a pretty good working relationship with our county attorney's office, and uh, it's just a, a matter of communicating back and forth to, you know, to verify whether or not that person. And we go by a case by case basis. Uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, some of these cases they they're not necessarily required to testify uh, if they reach a plea agreement. Okay, great. Uh, another question from Raquel, uh, is it, if, if it's up to officer discretion to determine what counts as substantial physical abuse and mental abuse, um, example harassment, stalking, and slapping, what would, would that qualify? Um, I, I can talk a little bit about uh, the emotional abuse and substantial abuse. I think some of the factors, it's really a case-by-case -case determination, uh, but from an emotional substantial physical or emotional abuse, uh, people are looking at or should be looking at the nature of the injury inflicted or suffered, the severity of the perpetrator's uh, conduct, the severity of the harm suffered, uh, and, and how long this has gone on and whether it's uh, been repeated acts in conjunction with verbal threats, uh, and also looking at was there permanent or serious harm to the victim in terms of appearance, health, physical or mental soundness. Um, it's kind of the, the totality of the circumstances and, and also recognizing that some of the most damaging uh, fear in, can be instilled in somebody is can be emotional. The threat of being killed, the threat of the children being uh, uh, killed uh, can be substantial and, and very overwhelming in addition to deportation. So I think it's looking at the big picture and trying to connect with that victim, trying to ask them how do they feel, what do they believe is going to happen next, uh, will will be more than enough to uh, get you head in the right direction. Okay, great. And I have a couple of questions which I'm, I'm going to quickly answer. Benny said, is there a list of qualifying crimes for the U visa? Uh, uh, yes, we actually had a list of them in, in this presentation. And, um, and, and we'll actually email out the presentation. It's actually going to be hosted on Vera's and Legal Momentum's uh, website. So, so you'll have access to that. Uh, John, uh, that also answers your question about whether we can email copies of the presentations. We will. And then um, uh, Ken also asked that, and, and we will email them. So let me ask, so there's a couple more questions, and I know we only have everybody for about four more minutes, so let's see if we can get them. Uh, Sylvia asked, there is the S visa for witnesses of a crime. Uh, isn't there? And, and, and there is. Um, uh, Edna, do you know where they might be able to find more info on that? Um, I can, well, actually, a good place might be to, to contact IWP at legalmomentum.org. Um, the S visa is something that's applied for by law enforcement, um, and there is a specific contact number. Um, if IWP doesn't have it, I can also forward that on as well. Okay. And, 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 and I 
uh, WP is basically the, that email address. It's uh, Edna's looking at it. I'm looking at it. So it's not you're not just emailing it, you know, into like space. Uh, you, you'll get a response. Um, I have two more questions. Uh, one from Rebecca. What about the mother of a child who is sexually assaulted? Would the mother be eligible? So I think if the child is um, undocumented, then that child could be the applicant, but the parents of that child could be included on as derivatives. The U visa also allows certain family members to write on an application as well, too, and be included um, to, to give family unity, which would help with um, recovering from the crimes that, this, that the victim has suffered from. If the child is a U.S. citizen, then the parents could be considered indirect victims and could also qualify for the U. Okay, wonderful. And the last question that has come in is from Jay. My understanding was under the final rules, the certification must be done by someone specifically designated by the head of an agency, while interim rules had allowed any supervisor. Is my understanding of this change correct? And from my reading of it, you're correct. Um, when we covered this, uh, we mentioned that uh, it, it, the person who signs it would be uh, would have to be designated by the head of an agency. And actually, um, in our toolkit, which you can download at iwp.legalmomentum.org, um, within the toolkit, we have a letter, um, a sample letter that can be sent by the head of the agency, the chief or the sheriff, uh, designating somebody. Okay, and with that, I have two minutes to go. If anybody has one last question, feel free to send it in. Uh, but if not, I think we're, we're – I don't have any other uh, questions. I, I, I do want to take the time to thank everybody for joining us. Um, it, it was a really great discussion. I, I, I really enjoyed seeing all these questions coming in. And hopefully, um, everybody learned something about, about the U visa and how law enforcement can – uh, use the U visa proactively as part of a, a community policing scheme. And one thing that I did want to mention is that we're hoping to have um, uh, more of these webinars. We're hoping that maybe the next webinar will be a little bit more advanced where we deal with some of these uh, other issues that are coming up. So uh, we'll, we'll definitely contact everybody uh, and hopefully uh, have a couple more of these uh, uh, happening in, in the next couple of months, okay? So any last uh, questions or thoughts from the presenters? I, this is Pete. I would just like to encourage everybody to uh, get access to a copy of the toolkit for law enforcement uh, uh, use of the U visa. That's a very well done document that uh, has all, met much of the information that we discussed today. I, thank you, Pete. That's a <laughs> good recommendation there. I'll, I'll second that one. Um, okay, everyone. Well, uh, thank you so much. I uh, uh, we're gonna. It's three o'clock, so we're gonna let you all go. Thank you. Bye bye.